now, I'm in Korea right now, so, um, in Korea, the, uh, around Chuseok time, the families get together and they like to say a special word or a prayer or something to their, their, um, ancient family members who passed away. And, um, they'll come here and do a worship service around their, their gravesite. Now this may be the grandfather, grandmother, great aunt, great uncle, ancestor, we don't know exactly who, maybe the patriarch of the family. So, um, as you can see, they, uh, they put a nice mound up there. There's another one up the hill a little ways too. This is the tradition for Korea. Chuseok is usually in this, in the autumn time and it's coming up next week actually. I can see that someone put some fresh plastic flowers behind me so that uh, to show that they'd never die. Now this is interesting because God is so good. God is so good. He's given us such a great and grand hope for our future. He's given us the opportunity to not have to worry about where we're going after we die where we're, we're headed or where our parents, our grandparents have gone. We know from scripture that the dead know nothing and that when the breath has gone out of us, um, we all sleep in our, in our graves. And this is, this is good news for us. So we don't have to worry about, say, our parents looking down on us from heaven, seeing all of our mistakes that we make. We don't have to worry about seeing the mistakes our kids are making uh, later on, after we're passed away. So, God is so good. That's why Christ is coming back to, to take us to be with Him. Now, we have this great hope. And this great hope is possible because of the sacrifice that Christ made for us. And so, this is such a, a beautiful thing that He has done, that He is taken the vengeance, the, the penalty for our sin, out of the way. So it is no longer uh, an excuse, a reason for us not to be able to follow Him. He's also given us His Holy Spirit, and He's been so gracious, give us His Holy Spirit, so that His Holy Spirit can work in our hearts to woo us, to bring us back, to draw us closer to Him and move us along the path into the most holy place and to mature us in our faith, to grow us so that we will bear good fruit for Him. This most holy place is a place of connection with God, a place of at one with Him or atonement with Him, a place where He speaks to us and we can speak to Him clearly without any veil standing between us, without any hindrance. He can actually commune with us in a very real way. Even when he was talking to his disciples, Jesus says that first he was, uh, they were called servants. He said, I don't call you servants anymore. This is the next level. He says, I'm calling you brothers, right? Brothers with Christ. Do you know what that means? If Jesus is a son of God, which he is, then being a brother to the son of God makes you kind of like him. And he says, it's enough that you be like me and not above me. You know, it's enough that you be like the Master. So no one's above Him. So what He's offering is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Okay, we talked about getting into the ark. What does that mean? In the New Testament, it talks about like uh, the days of Noah, so will the end, end times be. The days of Noah. What happened in the days of Noah? Well, in the days of Noah, there was a man in Noah who was told by God to build an ark. And it was a giant boat to put he, himself and his whole family in. And when he started building this thing, everyone probably thought he was crazy. So they came around to laugh at him while he was building his ark. And he said, you know, the whole world, it'll be water everywhere, right? What would you think if you saw an old man for 120 years saying the same thing? Well, the first year you might believe, the second year you might believe, maybe even 15 years in you might believe. But he doesn't really know when it's going to happen. He just knows that, well, when my grandfather dies, it'll come. <laughs> so, but he was, he had lived to be the, the oldest man on the face of the planet, you know, 969 years of Methuselah, right? 
So, no one really knew when it was going to come. Okay, he's getting really old. Uh, maybe he'll never die. Who knows? Maybe it won't ever happen. People started making predictions. Probably. People just sat around to see what would happen. And uh, guess what happened? Yeah, you know the story. Uh-oh. So, they sat around watching, and all the animals got in. People didn't get in. They should have taken that as a hint or a clue. Instead, they taunted him, probably saying, you know, wow, it stinks in there, probably pretty bad. Um, how, how, how you doing in there, Noah? Um, if they had loudspeakers, they'd probably be like, hey, look, Noah, yo, why don't you come out? You know, Angel shut the door. It's already too late. They're still making fun of him. Seven days passed. And during those seven days, they had a chance to change your mind, but realize that nobody after, even after seeing that door close, nobody went knocking on the door saying, you know what, I changed my mind, I want in. Nobody. Nobody. Do you think that God would have opened that door again and let somebody in if they had changed their mind? Perhaps. Now here's the thing. Perhaps. But you know what? Their minds were so set against getting in that ark by that by 120 years of rejection, that nothing would get them into that ark. Nothing. So, that seven days was to prove to God, the universe, and all, not to God, but to mankind and all the universe who was watching, all the angels, that yes indeed, people's hearts had truly 100% been judged correctly by God. That even though the door was shut, until they saw water, nobody changed their mind. Nobody. I'm sure there was not some little kid out there going, bam, 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 let me in, I'm sorry, I changed my mind, I want in. Why? Because they didn't, they didn't want to look bad. They're looking around, I don't see anybody else knocking on the door, I don't see anybody else trying to get in. Oh, uh, it looks like we made the right choice. All that taunting and all the jeering and probably persecution. They might have even tried to burn it down. They're probably gonna, they're probably trying to plan a cookout. Well, let's see how we can destroy this thing, this aberration. And guess what happened? The fountains of the deep broke open and panacea, as some people call it, that, that you know, the, the, the planet, you know, how the, the continents are interlocked, that we say that they couldn't have been interlocked, they were. And the fountains of the deep broke open. I don't know whether it was an asteroid or what, but somehow those tectonic plates began to move and water, which was underneath underneath the, uh, the land, began to shoot out salt water. For the first time, it began to rain. So the world before the flood and the world after the flood were two different worlds. As uh, the fountains of the deep broke open, and as the Bible says, then the whole world was flooded with water and flooded everything, covered the mountaintops. Then there was silence, except for inside of the ark. So here's a question. What is it that wasn't in the ark and remained alive during the flood, but was not Satan or his angels? Any idea? I'll give you a second to think about it. One, if you're going to survive a world that is going to be destroyed by water, you're going to need a watercraft, like uh, an ark that is covered with pitch, and pitch makes your boat waterproof. Basically, it's black tar. So, the ark was most likely a big black boat, okay? Going along in the water, waterproof, okay? Or, you're going to need to be able to survive outside the ark, and the ones that survived outside the ark were water creatures. Yes, that's right. Loch Ness Monster, you know, the fish, the whales, the sharks, those things would survive the flood. So, if you are going to survive a world that's going to be destroyed by water, you're going to need to be a water creature or get inside of the ark. Now, we know from the Bible, from Revelation and what Jesus says, the world will be destroyed by fire. 
Now, how would you survive a world that is destroyed by fire? Any ideas? I'll give you a moment. If you want to survive a world that's going to be destroyed by fire, you're going to need to be a fire creature. But the problem is, we're not fire creatures, are we? I'm not an angel, and you're probably, you're probably not an angel, my guess. So, what are we going to need to do? What other options are there for us, for you and for me? What can we do? We're like wood. We burn. I burn. We burn. Okay? Our flesh burns. So what can we do? We're going to need to live in some kind of arc in order to be able to survive the end of time. Now, to do this, God has provided just that. It's the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant is amazing. It's made of wood, but it's covered with gold. Now, the top of it is like the... Um, the top of it is solid gold, it's a mercy seat, it has two angels on the side, and those two angels are looking down at the mercy seat, the mercy of God, and uh, this is the box that all of those other items are in, we think we covered this already. So consider that these two angels that have been beaten into shape um, kind of represent the beating that Christ took and that his, his whole government of heaven has taken for so long, and the pounding that he's had by, by the enemy and his forces. In order to survive this, this end of the world scenario, God has provided this ark with these three items inside of it to save our souls and to provide a fireproof box for us. This is kind of how it works. Gold. Gold is amazing. This is all symbolic, by the way, but gold is still an amazing element. Gold is like a great reflector of heat. So what NASA has actually decided to do is they're astronauts, they've got this face shield that they use, and when, when they have to look up at the sun, the, they have to bring their visor down. And that visor, when it comes down, will reflect the sunlight so that they don't burn their face. They would cook otherwise. So they're actually able to withstand the heat of the sun as a result of having that transparent gold over their face shield. So this is a beautiful way for God to illustrate the, the salvation that he's given us, that he's giving us. God has given his life for you to save you so that you can be his valuable possession, his, his priceless gem, his peculiar treasure, and he's created a treasure box to save you inside of this until the end of the world so that you can live in the most holy place in the ark of the covenant safely until he comes again and he will redeem you off the planet as a result of you living in the ark now we're going to go a little further and we're going to talk about how we can live in this ark and what that's all about getting into the ark very important concept get into the ark how do we do it? What do we have to do? So we have a hope for our future. And so that we have a way to go and a place to go after all this. Now this Ark of the Covenant, it basically is a covenant. It's a promise. It's a place for us to connect with God. It's not just a box. It's actually a relationship. That's why they call it atonement when you go in there, at one minute. It's the mystery of the connection with God. God wants to be one with you. He wants to connect with you on a very intimate and personal level. Think of it like a marriage relationship with God. God wants to be married to you. Like in, your maker is your husband, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. Consider that. Your maker is your husband. God is your maker. He's the one who created you. He's the one who made you who you are. He wants to be one with you. He wants to be connected with you. 
look at all the things around him. I mean, look at nature. Look at all the the plants, the ferns, the trees, the rocks. Do you know how, how much detail goes into making each and every one of these things? Creation is an amazing thing. It's harder to believe in evolution than it is in, English, in uh, creation because seeing a benevolent God create all these things, it's amazing. Um, but it takes a lot more faith to believe in evolution. Consider that all these things that we see around us, all these rocks, all of these trees, all of these mountains, all of the, the sky and the world around us was all created by the hand of the Master, by the, the Word that came out of his mouth. So his Word has power. And this is the same being who wants to make a forever relationship with you. You. He wants to make a connection with you. And he wants to be not just your best friend, but he wants to be your spouse, the, the one who's married to you, the one who cares the most about you. And he wants to do this for all eternity. This is amazing. This in itself, this mystery being revealed to us, is in itself a type of miracle. The question that I have for you today is, what are you going to do about that? Are you going to seek out a connection with the one who can be your everything? Are you going to seek out a connection with the God of the earth, the God of the whole earth? Your maker, your creator. He's done everything he can to seek out a relationship with you. And uh, he came and he died for you. This is that you wouldn't have to live forever. He didn't have to live forever without you. To get into the ark, what's needed is a complete and total covenant with God. It's it's a, you need to consecrate yourself to him to basically do what the people on the outside of the ark did when the high priest was inside. They had a number of different things that they did. One was they'd call a holy convocation. Basically, they'd all get together and they'd clean out their camp. They would uh, change their clothes. They'd change their diet and they would pray. And these are the different things that are, you could say, are required of us today. The principle is still the same, even though the details of what they actually did changed. So, to upgrade our faith and our connection with God, there are these things that we can do to make it closer and a more secure relationship with him. In addition to that, consider making Bible study, not just studying the Bible, but making a, making a conscious effort to memorize the scriptures. Make it a part of your life. Get the Ten Commandments. Memorize those. Live them in your everyday life. And encourage others to live it too. Invite the Holy Spirit into your life, into your heart. Make a covenant with God. Make a connection with Him. Make a promise to Him that you would like His Holy Spirit to help you keep. Now, we are human, it's true, and we're going to probably break our promise, but don't ever be afraid or ashamed to ask for forgiveness from God. And get up, dust yourself off, and try again. It's important, very important, that you rely on God's Holy Spirit to take you through, because we can't do this alone. Christ has overcome the enemy. Christ has overcome Satan. The enemy is like a roaring lion. He's seeking whom he may devour, a little like these mosquitoes here. They're seeking me to devour me and eat me alive. <laughs> and the enemy is just like that. He wants to distract us from even receiving this message that we're getting right now. 
So consider that in order to survive, in order to, to overcome, we're going to need help and we're going to need the Holy Spirit's help. And that comes in the form of calling on Him continually and asking Him to be with you and to guide you and to give you strength and to help you bear the, the burdens every day that you may go through. Um, we all have problems in our life. We all have struggles that we go through, some more than others. It's that Holy Spirit that is there to comfort us and take us through those times. You know, God did not promise that everything would be smooth sailing for you once you become a Christian, but um, He did promise that He would be with you till the end and that He would send the Comforter to, to help you stay in the way that you should go. So rely heavily on the Holy Spirit and He'll be a strength to you. So that is pretty much it for the, for, the, for the Most Holy Place and for the Ark of the Covenant. Now, we said that we're going to talk about the Ten Commandments, and so I'll get to that in a little bit. The sum of the whole matter is this, and it's found in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. It actually talks about the whole duty of mankind, the whole purpose uh, that why God has put us here on earth. It says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So a lot of people are saying, hey, why am I here? What is my purpose here on, on this planet? It's so that we can keep the commandments of God and so that we can fear God. A lot of people ask the question, what does it really mean to fear God? Does it mean, oh, I'm afraid, be very afraid? Is that what it's talking about, be scared of God? Um, in a way, a lot of pastors will say no, but yes, actually, it does mean to be afraid of God. Not afraid to the point that you're going to go and run and hide in a little cave somewhere. Um, but the kind of fear that lets us realize to stop and think, wait a second, what I'm doing is not right in God's sight. I need to change my life. I need to change the way I do things. I need to um, truly connect with Him. Let's put it this way. When an army is coming to invade a country, there's two responses, fight or flight. Okay, so if you can't get away, then what's your other option? Fighting. But if the army is way too powerful and your fight is basically gonna annihilate you and you can't escape, there's a third option. What's that third option? Have you ever heard the phrase, if you can't beat them, join them? 
in this case, our fear, I know that's a very human way of thinking, our fear leads us to join God's army. Um, leads us to join forces with God because we know that He is supreme, that He is uh, sovereign over everything, that He is uh, the one and the only the buck stops here with Him. So, because He's the one who we will have anything to do with at the end of time, He's the one who is going to redeem us. He's the one who issues salvation. He's the one who owns eternal life. Uh, and he's the one who can cure us of this whole sin problem. All he wants to do is get is clean us of sin and get us to live with him. And he, he's not coming around to just destroy everything. He, what he's trying to do is he's trying to say, hey, um, can I hang with you? <laughs> can I be with you? Can I spend my eternity with you? I want to rest in your arms. I want you to rest in my arms. I want us to be together. I want, I want togetherness. I want to be family. We always talk about family. Family is very important. What about the family of God? What about His family? What about seeing Him as your true Father in heaven? Seeing Him as your dad? Seeing Him as, seeing Christ as your brother, your big brother? seeing the angels as family members, God's angels. <laughs> what about the family of God? What about all those people on the other planets that are waiting, waiting, waiting for you to join them? Think about that. So, fear God and keep His commandments. We're talking about making the system on Earth, the life we have here on Earth, the same as it is on all the other planets. Now, of course, Earth will still have to be uh, not renovated, but completely destroyed and recreated by God, because we're not trying to fix the planet. It's already destroyed beyond recognition. I mean, what God had intended, it's just about shot. So, He's going to have to make it over. So, we're not trying to renovate the planet, but what he's saying is, keep the commandments of God, because in doing that, you will have a mark placed on you. Basically, you're picking yourself by obeying the Ten Commandments. So, the law of heaven is kept in heaven. And in the, the Lord's Prayer, it says, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth, as it is in heaven. Heaven is not just the place where he lives. Heaven is everywhere else, except here. <laughs> so, the whole point is God wants us to keep his commandments here on earth in the same way that it's kept everywhere except here. His law is very popular everywhere else except earth. If we could see all the other planets that are actually keeping the commandments, we would realize just how far off we are. And we'd probably fall into a lot of really heavy depression <laughs> as a result of it. But <laughs> or we'd probably get with the program. Let's take a look at the Ten Commandments. And God speak all these words saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, nor any likeness of anything which is in the heaven above, or which is in the earth beneath, or which is in the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless which taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days 
The Lord made heaven and the earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The next one. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. So those are the Ten Commandments, one through ten. And let's back up a little bit. Now the first one was, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. First we need to understand the language, what's being used here, because I know I said a lot of words, you probably are like, What? This is Old English! I don't do Old English! What's Old English? Thou, thy, thou shalt, shalt, what is this? So, I'm going to kind of break it down for you. The word shalt, or shall, shall is akin to, or the same as, the word should and the word will put together. Okay, think will. I will do this. I won't do this. I want to do this. It's all part of the word will. The, the root word will. Okay, that's where the owl, the shall, owl. Okay, the sh at the beginning, shall, is basically should. You should not do this thing. You should not do it. But he's not saying you shouldn't do it. He's, and he's not saying you won't do it. He's actually saying, you should not want to do it. Changes the meaning, huh? Doesn't it? Okay. If the commandments are saying, you should not want to do something, should not want, why shouldn't I want to do it? Jesus gives us that key. He actually says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, you're not going to want to dot, dot, dot have other gods before me? Are you? I mean, you love me, right? If you love me, you're not going to want to have any other gods before me. Okay, think about this also. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 54, verse 5. For thy maker is thine husband. He's your husband. Thine, thine, you. You, plural. The Lord of hosts is his name, and thy, thy is like your, plural, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. The Holy One of Israel is the God of the whole earth. He's your God. He's my God. He's their God. Right? The God of the whole earth shall he be called. So that's who Yahweh is. That's who Jehovah is. That's who God is. That's who we're talking about. So I'm just sticking with what it says here, God of Israel. We're talking about Yeshua. Okay? So, God is your husband. That's the first one. First commandment. God is your husband. Now, if we have a clear understanding of this, our marriages will be run differently. Right? If God is my husband, I'm, I'm part of the church, the body of the church, the, the bride, the woman, uh, then my husband, being God, has every right to tell me what to do. So, this is very interesting because a lot of marriages these days are running into problems because of this very thing. And this is why we need to kind of break this down a little bit because we are not following the Ten Commandments if we are not following the head of our household. Because when we follow the head of our household, assuming that he's God-fearing, that he understands his role as husband, and that he's leading in the right direction, uh, and following God. If he's a God-fearing man following God, doing what he should be doing, why not follow him? So, the concept here is, that God is our husband, um, the perfect husband, and he is entirely and 100% faithful always. 
He's not going to let you go. God will hold on to you. He cares about you. And He will do whatever it takes to show you that connection, that relationship that you have with Him is solid. So, He says, I'm your husband. He belongs to you. And the great part is that you belong to Him too. So, that's the first commandment. That togetherness, that oneness. He's like, if you love me, stay with me. All right? Now, the second commandment, it talks about images, graven images, idols. It's pretty much anything that takes the place of God. Uh, what we see, what we behold, we tend to become like. So, it could be television. Is it possible that the reason why we have a hard time worshiping God and connecting with Him and having prayer time where we're not seeing images in our mind of you know, movies? Is it because, possibly, that we have a distraction dilemma in our lives? So God wants the praise. God wants the things that He deserves as Creator. He wants the attention from His children and from His bride that He deserves. Consider what kind of God we're serving. He is merciful. He is just. He's loving. He is never distracted from loving us. He's continually doing all He can for you. Now let's look at the third commandment, taking the name. The name. What is God's name? God's name is holiness. His name is honorable. His name is righteous. He's the provider. He's our salvation. God Himself, He is a man of His word. And when He lives out His name, or His character before us, it's simply righteousness. I mean, He's always doing good things. Look at what Christ did. When Christ came, what did He do? He preached, He spoke the message, He told us of heaven, He told us of the Father. He was continually about His Father's business. Not only that, but He also healed people. He went around, and wherever there was a need, he gave them exactly what they needed, healing. And so, God is about healing. That is His character. Consider this, like, heaven is all health. It's all about health in heaven. There is no brokenness, there is no death, there is no getting cancer, there is no getting diabetes, there is no anything like that. Heaven is all health. So, for a person to want to live out God's name uh, and not take His name in vain, meaning to bear His name, you know, not just on your shirt, but in your life, to say, hey, I'm a Christian. To be called a Christian, truly a Christian, is to live out His life in your life. His life in your life. So that means that if I'm saying, hey, I'm a Christian, I'm going to live a healthy life in mind, in mind, in body, and in spirit, okay? In my decisions, I'm going to try and make these clear decisions and clear judgments and continually invite the Holy Spirit to be a part of my life so that His fruit will come out in my, in my example. That's what it means to not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. So we ought to be like Christ in the way that we live out our lives. Okay, let's look at the next commandment. The fourth commandment, it says remember. Okay, there is something about this that we need to understand. What he's really saying in it, because you, you know he doesn't say, thou shalt not do anything. He's not saying, should, shall, shalt. He's actually saying, remember. That means that there is something to remember. What are we remembering? Remember the beginning of the earth, which was creation, where... God made a Sabbath. God made a Sabbath. He actually hallowed this day and said, Hey, this is special. This is really special. You're going to love this. It's a day where we can be together. Okay, so think about God saying, If you love me, we'll be able to spend time together. You'll remember that I'm your creator. You'll remember that I'm the one who made you. You'll, you'll we'll be able to spend time to get forever together. So remember me, and I'll remember you, okay? It's like that. He's the creator of heaven. That means like 
the sky here, as well as the heavens beyond. Earth, all these rocks, you know, Earth. The sea, and everything in the sea, right? All the fish that are jumping, all the crabs running around here, all the barnacles on the rocks. <clears throat> he made all that. He made all that beautiful forest that's actually behind the camera, you can't even see it. Beautiful trees. Okay, he made all that. God loves creating stuff. Now he's resting right now because he doesn't need to create anything more. He's done it. We're his crowning achievement. And the reason why we are his crowning achievement is going back to that other verse, so that we would accomplish his purpose in proving God is righteous by following his commandments and doing them with a loving heart and a willing spirit. That's what it's about. And the reward for that is a place with him in heaven. So God in the fourth commandment is saying, hey, I miss my time with you. I want to be together with you. Would you like to be together with me at the appointed time that I've set? to be together with you. God has a special time with you. That special time is truly a special time. Call on the Lord while he is near. That means that there's a time when he is nearer than other times. Consider that it could be that Sabbath is that special time when he is nearest to us, where he can connect with you. He's there hearing and watching and surveying your life every Sabbath. That just could be that personal time that we might be missing with him if we're doing other things. Okay, so the God of creation who created your mind and your body is there and wanting to redeem you and bring you back to himself. The earth is, has a very short lifespan it's actually not billions of years, not millions of years, not even uh, tens of thousands. It's more like 6,000 years. And we're heading into the 7,000 year. Now this is kind of interesting. Remember that the Bible says, a day is like unto a thousand years. And a thousand years is like a day. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8 says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Okay. Basically, He's giving us time to turn ourselves around and to connect with him. That's kind of the idea behind it. So, what we're seeing in this is the weekly cycle that he's given us, the 7,000 years that we've been living on Earth, the last thousand years could possibly be the time when we're in Heaven. Now, I'm not trying to count, but I am, I am saying that the end of the world is very close very, very close. And if we've been living 6,000 years and we've got a millennium that historicists say that we'll be in heaven with God, that's something worth looking forward to. Consider that time is short and that the Sabbath is actually pointing forward to something that's about to happen. Number five, honor thy father and mother. Okay. God honors everyone uh, he's no respecter of persons. However, he has set up a, a hierarchy of command. I think Paul talks about in Romans, he, he says that we ought to honor the government. You know, he doesn't wear the sword in vain. So whether we honor parents, whether we honor the government or our teachers or so on, we need to honor the set order of authority from the top down. Because God is a king, God is our Lord, and he has people in command over us. So we need to Obey the law, and that's what he's saying also. So obey your parents, obey your teachers, those who, of course, teach parents in the Lord, those who have parents who obey God. That's what it's talking about. In short, the concept is 
it says, thou shalt not kill. You're not going to want to kill if you love me. That's what Jesus is saying. You're not going to want to commit adultery if you love me. If you love me, you're not going to want to steal or lie or cheat or, or all of these different things. You're not going to want your neighbor's stuff if you love me. So that's what Jesus is really saying in the Ten Commandments. That's what God is really trying to say is, if you love me, why not keep them? It's not so hard because you love me. A wife is going to want to wash the dishes and do laundry because she loves her husband. It's just, she'll sing while she's washing dishes, la, 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 you know, because she loves her husband. Oh, it's a burden if she doesn't love her husband, right? Consider that. So that's where I want to leave you right now. I want to wrap up and I'm going to hike out of here before I lose my daylight, okay? But uh, I just want to have a quick prayer with you before we go, all right? Let's pray. Our dear, loving Heavenly Father, I'd like to thank you so much for the opportunity to share this message with these people. And I do ask that as they hear this, that it be a blessing to them. I'm sharing it from my heart, I'm sharing it from my experience, I'm sharing it from what I've studied. And I pray that it be received in the best possible way, help them to think the most positive way about it. I do ask, Lord, that when, as they receive it, that it fall on these words fall on hearts that are ready to hear this message. I ask that you fertilize the ground of their heart and blossom and, and create a beautiful plant that will grow up to righteousness in their lives. Thank you, Lord. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. for coming out here was actually to talk about the sanctuary. This is an interesting experiment. This is a whole new experience for me. I've never really done this before. Heavenly Father, um, I do ask that as I discuss what I remember about the sanctuary, help me to speak as if I'm speaking to an individual and not just the whole world. It help to be a blessing to them as well as to me. If I were somebody else, Kind of advice would I give myself, hoping that there will be someone who's a lot like me out there who needs to hear this and will be touched um, by some by a good message. Thank you, Lord. I pray these things in Jesus' name.